I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your uh, Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 9. Romans 9 is our text uh, today. Again, we, we looked at it last week. Uh, if you don't have a, a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,123, and you will find Romans chapter 9. And as always, if you're here and you need a Bible, you don't have one and you want one, then please take one of these with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God. We want you to read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, uh, we, we think highly of Scripture here at Calvary. In fact, we believe the Bible is the infallible, inerrant Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. And, and so we want you to read it. We want you to study it. We want you to learn it. We want you to memorize it. We want you to join life groups where you can look at it with other believers. We want you to uh, let it be part of your life because we know that, uh, that that's how God changes us. He teaches us truth so that we really can live in freedom. Now, we also know that throughout history, people who love Jesus and who love the Bible and, and who were on mission for Christ have come to differing viewpoints when they read the Bible, when they study the Bible, when they, they try to find the answers and understand how the, what the Bible teaches us. And, and so uh, I mentioned that because last week we talked about God's sovereignty and election based on Romans 9. And uh, we knew going into that that there were going to be a lot of people who hadn't heard what we shared or were confused by what we shared, disagreed with what we shared because that wasn't what they were taught growing up. And, and that was okay. And I wanted you to know that's okay. You don't, I don't feel any compulsion that you have to agree with me. All right. Uh, when I'm teaching scripture, there are more than one biblical viewpoint on, on the subject we're looking at today and last week. And I just want you to, to know that. Because I want us to respect one another, I want us to value one another, and, and I want us to unite on who Jesus is, on the mission that he gave to us, and our love for one another as people of God. Uh, because that's really clear in Scripture. So, uh, as I say that, uh, this weekend we invited questions from last week's message. And you guys gave us questions, lots of questions. And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to answer those questions, or at least some of them. Couldn't answer all of them. We kind of grouped them up into categories and, and kind of took them on. Some of you uh, that emailed me questions, I just answered directly because you asked a real specific question. Uh, if you wrote it out on a, on a prayer card and dropped it in the offering box uh, and, and I don't answer your question in this message, email us. We'll certainly uh, try to answer your question. And all the pastors at Calvary are available to sit down with you and talk about the questions you have. So if your question doesn't get answered, you've got more questions after today, that's perfectly fine with us. Uh, just call and make an appointment. Let us buy you lunch or breakfast or, or uh, sit down with you for a few minutes and, and talk about the Word of God because we love it when people are seeking God and wanting to learn more about Him. Now, before diving into the specific questions, I just want to briefly look back at the major points last week because some of you weren't here last week. Uh, you may want to go home and listen to that message uh, from last week. But let me just give you a summary. And it's real simple, it's real short, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, uh, but I'm going to point you back to the sermon last week, I'm going to point you back to the scripture from last week, so that you can look at that again, but I'm not going to read Romans 9 again, I'm not going to go through all of that in its entirety. First of all, though, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. We're talking about God's sovereignty, God is king, God is creator, God is designer of everything that is. It's his world, he's in control, and he's the one who knows how it functions best. And so we want to learn from him, that's why I want you to read scripture. And as those of us who've pledged allegiance to Jesus, okay, if you're here and you believe Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, you've already pledged allegiance to God as Lord, as sovereign, as King. You've already submitted to him. And so our posture when we come to God is one of submission. It's one of serving. It's one of worship. It's one of trust because he's our Savior and he's our Lord. So when we talk about God as sovereign, we see that in the Old Testament because God chose Israel to be his people. He established them as a nation. He revealed himself to them. He gave them the law and the, and the covenants. He, he raised up prophets and ultimately he sent Jesus into the world to, uh, through the people of Israel. And then God chooses us to be his people in Christ. And again, I, I listed uh, a lot of scriptures that we shared last week. I encourage you to read those again and look at those again. But uh, what that means is that God initiates the salvation experience. 
God initiates that salvation experience. Uh, Joseph just shares, shared 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Next verse. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself in Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. God was acting in our lives. Uh, Ephesians 2 talks about how we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God has made us alive in Jesus. And so God acted. Uh, someone has to go first. And, and whatever way you look at the salvation scenario, somebody has to go first. Uh, and I believe Scripture clearly indicates that God goes first. So that means that we choose to follow Jesus because God chose us. He's working in our lives, drawing us to himself, and we chose him because he chose us first. Now, that created a lot of questions, a lot of struggles, a lot of frustration on people's parts. And they, you guys, you guys at, did what I asked you to do. You sent questions, and I appreciate that. I love that. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the questions now. We're going to dive in and, and see if the questions you ask or some of you ask help clarify the issues for everyone, or if they just generate more questions. I'm always open to those. So uh, couldn't each answer each question uh, specifically, so we kind of grouped them, and, uh, and like I said, I responded to emails, and I will respond to emails, so if I don't answer your question in the course of today, uh, then please uh, don't just get frustrated. Go ahead and communicate that. So first question, how do we reconcile statements in the Bible about freedom, God's love, and God's sovereignty? In other words, and, and people wrote this out, I don't think the Bible contradicts itself, but how do I understand some of these verses that, that don't seem to go together? Like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Or, or John 1, 29, when John the Baptist saw Jesus and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or how about 1 John 4, 10, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Or first Peter chapter or first Peter, second Peter chapter three, uh, verse nine, that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, but instead he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then Romans chapter nine, verse fourteen and following, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. How do we understand those and others like them uh, together? Well, let's back up just a little bit. When you're studying Scripture, which by the way, the, the study of studying Scripture is called hermeneutics. You don't really need to know that, but you're going to hear that word sometimes, and, and so I just want you to know that I know what it means. Uh, so, well, you know, hey, sometimes you've got to drop the theological cred, right? So anyway, hermeneutics, it's just a study of, of the Bible. It's how we study it, and when we're going to read the Bible, we're going to understand Scripture, we have to look at the whole context. What does all of Scripture say about a subject? And we have to look at all of it together and try to, to make sense out of it. Uh, and we have to understand the audience that the writer is writing to. We have to understand the, the culture that it's written in, the context of those verses. Uh, for instance, Jesus' parables uh, are almost all agricultural. I did not grow up on a farm. I had to understand the agriculture of the first century to understand the parables, and, and that's just how we have to, to study Scripture. Uh, not only that, but uh, people try to teach systematic theology. You go to seminary, you go to Bible school, they're going to teach you systematic theology, which is a, an ordered way of trying to understand theology. The problem is the Bible is not written as a systematic the theology book. And so we're trying to take the, the whole and put it together and make sense of it, but you always have to look at the big picture. And, and I heard this joke years ago, and I loved it, so I, I'm going to tell it to you now. Uh, because if we don't, it's dangerous. You can actually make Scripture say just about anything you want it to say if you take it out of context. So there was this guy, and he was really upset, and he was a believer, but he didn't read the Bible much, so he didn't know where to look for answers. He's like, God, I need to hear from you, so I'm just going to open the Bible, and I'm going to point at a verse on the page, and I want you to speak to me. So he did that. He opened it up, pointed at a verse, and it said, Judas went and hung himself. All right, God, I'm not really sure what you're trying to say to me, so I'm going to try this again. And he opened it up, and he pointed at the page and says, Go thou and do likewise. 
All right, God, I'm not really sure this is what you want, so I'm going to try this again, third time, so I need to hear from you. He opened it up, pointed at the page, and said, what you do, do quickly. <laughs> All right, so we want to look at the whole of context, okay? And, and, and that's just really important when you're studying Scripture, so uh, I, I, I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, but when we study it, we understand it differently. For 2,000 years, Christians have been arguing about what the, the Word of God says, and how to understand it, and how to apply it. And so we are also influenced by our upbringing, and by our culture, and by our experiences when we read Scripture. And, and our goal is to try to, to remove that, but we can't because we're sinners and, and we're limited. So, so there's all these different issues that we as Christians are, are, are debating and discussing, and there's tension in those because some people want to look at this verse and give it more weight than another verse. And so there's tension between, like, love and judgment. And there's tension between faith and works. And there's tension between holiness and sinfulness. And there's tension in, in our subject of election between on one end of the spectrum, you have people who are saying it's, it's man's choice, we have free will, and we're the ones who decide uh, about whether we're going to be in a relationship with God or not. And on the other end of the, the tension, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, is that side that says, no, God is absolutely sovereign. In fact, some people would say God's so sovereign that, that he, you know, double predestination and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes he looks unkind from this viewpoint. On the other hand, on the other viewpoint, when it's all human will, he kind of looks like he's, he's maybe weak or responsive God, but he's not able to do all the stuff we want him to do. And so somewhere in that tension between free, freedom of will, absolutely, and so, absolute sovereignty, you have to make a choice which side you're going to lean to. Yeah, you have to make a decision. And because you can't straddle the line, all right? A lot of people try, but it's not comfortable to straddle a fence on anything. So uh, I lean toward sovereignty, okay? I, I lean toward God's sovereignty. I think the overwhelming uh, evidence of Scripture is that God is sovereign, that, that he's the one who went first, that he chose. And, and you just read the whole context. I can't get away from that. that that's how I understand it. There's, again, godly men and women who disagree, uh, and some of you are going, yeah, but what about the whole, you know, foreknowledge thing where God looked into the future and, and, and he saw who was going to pick him and so he chose them. All right, that's how I was raised to believe. That's good Baptist teaching, trying to straddle the fence. And, and so uh, here's the problem with that. For me, that means that, that people went first. That God made a decision based on my decision. That means I went first. And, and I really believe that scripture says that God acted first. So, now again, it doesn't matter which way you lean as long as you still know Jesus as your Lord. You've had that life-changing relationship with Jesus, and you respect people who, who disagree with you. Now, since I choose sovereignty, several people ask me about some of the verses in chapter 9 that seem a little bit harsh. Uh, like verse 13, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated, referencing the story in Genesis or, or verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I've raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in the earth. Or verse 22, what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And, and people said, um, how do we understand this, that, that God would choose some and, and others were prepared for destruction? In other words, does God create people that he loves to condemn them to hell. It's what's called double predestination, that God chooses some for heaven and he chooses others for hell. And, uh, and I don't believe that God does that, but let me tell you how I ex understand the revelation of Scripture. First of all, we, we all believe that God creates people. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and Genesis 1 tells us that he made us in his image. We're made in the image of God, so God creates people. And we also know from the story in Genesis that people rebelled against God. And, and, uh, and all of us have rebelled against God. And, and the wages of rebellion is judgment. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Death. So all of us, whether you realized it or not, chose hell. We all chose hell. We, all cho we chose hell. We made the decision to rebel against God, to reject God, and say, okay, God, we're going to live life our way. So judgment equals hell. So, you know, that's, that was our plan. That was our choice. That was our destination. And God intervened to save some, rescue some. Because there's only three options 
when you look at this big picture wise, what, what God's going to do with his creation? Either, option one, nobody gets saved. Option two, everybody gets saved. Or option three, some people get saved. Now, we know that option one is not really on the table, that nobody gets saved. Why do we know that? Because we're here. Right? I mean, and the whole biblical story is about how God is redeeming mankind from hell. So that's, that's the story. So we know that one's off the table. Option two, everybody gets saved. Now, there's some people who love God and who study the Bible that want that to be the, the end result. And they argue it from verses like, uh, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or, uh, you know, Second uh, Peter uh, 3, 9, where it says, God desires that all should come to repentance and none should perish. And they go, well, that's what's going to happen in the end. The problem with that, when you read the whole biblical context, is that there's a lot more verses that say things like Revelation 20, where it talks about the great white throne judgment at the end, and it says, and everyone's name not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Doesn't sound like everybody makes it. And then you listen to Jesus, and, the, and if you read the Gospels, and I really encourage you to read the Gospels, I, I spend time with Jesus, hang out and read a story. He, he tells these parables of judgment, and at the end, you know, stuff happens like, cast them out into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Does not sound like everybody gets in. Or just listen to the words of Jesus, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And people go, yeah, that's what, see, everybody gets in. Except that the next verse, John 3, 18 says, whoever believes in the son is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Jesus said everybody didn't get in. So, God saves nobody. Uh, that's options off. God saves everyone. Problem with biblical witness. So what does the Bible teach? God saves some. We all deserve damnation, plain and simple. We all deserve it. We all earned it. So if you have mercy, celebrate it. If you've received God's grace and you know it, then, then celebrate that. Give thanks to God for that. Rejoice in that because you're in. However you believe you got there, uh, if you know you're in, then, then be thankful for that. Uh, second question, then why is God waiting for Judgment Day? The world is evil, so why doesn't God just end it or recreate it after the fall? In other words, why don't they just forgive Adam and Eve and start over again uh, right then and there? Big question, multifaceted answer. Let me dive into them. First of all, uh, why is God waiting for Judgment Day? It's not for us to know when. Okay? It's just not for us to know. We've always wanted to know, and God's always told us, none ya. None of your business. Okay? Acts chapter 1, 6 and 7. Then they gathered around Jesus and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. This is none of your business. You don't need to know. What you need to do is know this. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. He gave them a job. He said, just do it until I come. Okay? Until I come. Uh, see, we always want to know when. And Jesus just repeatedly said, you're not going to know, so be ready. You're not going to know. Uh, and, and the other thing is we always want it now. Right? We always want God to come back now. I, there's sometimes we want it more than others, like, right? Like the night before final exams, right? Anybody else ever pray that Jesus would come back before we took the test? <laughs> See, uh, I, I always did. I was like, God, if you're coming back now, can you do it the day before the test, not the day after? Because uh, I don't want to waste my time doing this. Uh, so, you know, that's why his way. And then secondly, Second uh, Peter 3 says God is patient. And wants everyone to repent. And, and some people say, well, yeah, but why is he waiting so long? Why didn't he just go ahead and do it sooner? Well, okay, Second Peter 3 also says to the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Okay, God's understanding of time and ours, really different. Really different. We don't relate to time the way that God does. Okay, we're in time, we're linear. We, but, you know, to God, it's only been a couple of days since Jesus' resurrection. You think about it, perspective. We know how fast time goes, right? Those of us that are a little bit older really know how fast time goes. And, and it's just a blink of an eye, and we're at the end, uh, toward the end of our lives, and we kind of go, wow, 
that, that whole eternal perspective thing sounds kind of good. Third, the reason God couldn't just start over after Adam and Eve sinned uh, is because when they sinned, death entered the world and death tainted everything. It ruined everything. And, and, and God fixed the death problem by sacrificing his perfect son on the cross for us. And he will create a new heaven and a new earth one day. Again, 2 Peter 3, continuing on after verse 9. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with God's promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. In other words, God's handled this. He's going to recreate. Uh, Romans 8 says that the creation groans for redemption. It's waiting for that day when, when God's going to get rid of the sin taint in this world. and He's going to create a new world that's not tainted by sin. And by the way, we're going to get new bodies that aren't tainted by sin. And uh, yeah, it's kind of cool, but it also answers the question. I get asked all the time, is it okay if we get cremated or we have to get buried so that, you know, we, it, uh, can I, I tell people all the time, it doesn't matter if you flush yourself down the toilet, <laughs> okay? There is no part of your sin-corrupted body that God is going to use to give you a new body in heaven. You're going to get a brand new body. It's going to be perfect, e and you're going to love it, even if it's three feet tall and weighs 300 pounds, okay? I'm just, I'm just telling you, you're going you're gonna to love it. I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to be good. Now, let's answer the question behind this question. The question behind this question, and really the previous question, is this. Why did God make the world as he did? Why did God make the world the way they did? Why do people have to suffer? Why does, why does hell have to exist? Why did God give Adam and Eve, our ancestors, the freedom to screw it up? And then why were they so stupid? Right? Right? It's okay, though. If they hadn't been, we would have been. Right? Because we know how we're drawn to self-destruction. But we want to know why. Why is the world like it is? And, and here's the answer. We don't know. We don't know. I mean, there's lots of unsatisfactory theories, lots of theoretical theology where people are trying to answer this question and, and, and deal with it and argue and, and everything. But here's the thing. The Bible doesn't say why. Jesus didn't give us an answer. God didn't give us an answer. It, it, it really doesn't tell us why. And, and uh, here's what we do know. We know that we live in a broken world destructive world. We know that pain and suffering is caused by sin, and we know that God was willing to pay the price for our sin and redeem us through the sacrifice of Jesus. So we know we're loved and valued by God. And, and if you wrestle with wanting to question God about the why he made the world the way he did, if you want to accuse him, guess what? He can handle it. He can handle it. And if some of you need to have the conversations about that, uh, I'll invite that as well. Uh, God's not intimidated by our questions. He's not intimidated by our accusations. I would hope you would ask those questions in faith. I really would hope you would do that. And then after you vent against God about how he messed up the world, then turn to Job 38 through 41 and read it. It's the closest you're going to get to an answer. Job is a story of a, of a guy who lost everything. He was a good guy too, righteous guy. Best guy in the world uh, at the time. And, and uh, he lost his family. He lost his business. He, he got sick. He lost everything. And, and his friends were jerks. And, and then he accuses God. And God's response is pretty telling. He doesn't actually explain himself. He just kind of goes, Job, were you there when I created everything that is? Were you there? So, so God isn't intimidated, but he's also not obliged to give you an answer because he's sovereign. And, and here's the place that I, I really want you to get to. Uh, I want you to trust God. I, I really want you to trust God. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you're already trusting him for heaven. Okay, you're trusting him to forgive your sins and take you to heaven. So, so trust him with what you don't know as well. See, 
without faith, it's impossible to please God, and we want to come to God in faith, and we want to trust Him with our lives. But if you're already trusting Him to save you, why not trust Him with what you can't find out? Because none of the answers are satisfactory. None of the answers are going to lead you to a place of deeper love and trust. So I hope and pray that your relationship with Jesus is close enough that you'll trust Him when you don't know the answer yourself. I I look at it this way. You trust tons of people in your life every day that are are people who are sinners and they mess up you know i I just confess to you i trust my auto mechanic i I got one that i trust whether that's you know good or not it's for you to decide but here's the truth i can't fix the car myself and i trust him and if he tells me it needs to be fixed i I trust him now he can pull out the part and he can show me and he can give me details and all i hear is wah 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 okay because that's not, some of you are mechanics and you understand it. And you go, oh yes, I understand now. That's great. I, I get it. I don't understand. I trust. And he's proven himself trustworthy, so I trust him. And, and that's a great thing to have a mechanic that you trust, isn't it? Yeah, I'm trusting a mechanic. Why in the world wouldn't I trust the perfect God? Who demonstrated his love for me by sacrificing Jesus for me. Why in the world wouldn't I trust him when I don't know the answer, when I can't understand the answers? I do trust him. You've got to decide if, if you're going to trust him. Uh, next question. If we are predestined, do we have free will? And if we're predestined, why should we pray? Does it even matter? And, and why would we share our faith if people are predestined? Uh, again, multifaceted question, so here we go. Uh, scripture repeatedly affirms that we are predestined. Uh, Romans 8, Romans 9, Ephesians 1, uh, there's others. Uh, So let me just say this. We're predestined, but only at the point of salvation. Only at the point where God makes us alive. And and then once you've been made alive in Christ, guess what? You have free will. If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. And, And Scripture even tells us, hey, if you've been set free, don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you have free will, complete free will like nobody else on this planet does. So now you have the freedom to either obey or to disobey God. You have the freedom to submit or to rebel. You have the freedom to serve God or to be selfish. So you've got freedom. Uh, What are you going to do with it? And then Scripture also repeatedly encourages us to pray, even though God knows what we need before we ask. I mean, he tells us that. I know what you need before you ask, but he still invites us to pray. Why? Why? Because prayer is more about relationship than request. You know, if you don't hear anything else I say today, maybe you want to hear that one. Maybe write that one down. Prayer is more about relationship than request. Uh, Think about this in terms of relationship with your children, whether your children are little or whether they're grown. Okay, when they were little, uh, hopefully you had a, a, a relationship with your kids where you had conversation with your kids and they had conversation with you and you were involved in knowing about their day. And in fact, as a parent, you knew their needs before they asked most of the time. But you still wanted them to ask, and you wanted them to say, please, and thank you, right? You, you wanted them to be grateful, and you wanted be them to, to make a request, not a demand. And, and here's the thing. If you have a good relationship with your kids, no matter how old they are, and you're in conversation with them, and you're sharing your life with them, when they make a request... Are you predisposed to grant that request? I am. I don't know about you. You guys are mean parents, huh? you know. <laughs> you know, if you love your kids and, and, and they're living in a way that you approve and, and you celebrate, and, and you, yeah, you, if you can, you want to help them. On the other hand, if your kids are ungrateful and distant and the only, the only time they ever talk to you is when they need money, are you predisposed toward granting their request? No, you're not. Let's just be honest about it. And even when you do help them, you do it grudgingly. Ungrateful louts. Not going to let you starve, but, you know, I should. But you got my grandkid, right? Come on. We, we, we get it. And so think about this. We're in relationship with God. He's our Father. We're the children. If the only time you ever talk to God is because you need something from Him, you're treating Him like a cosmic ATM. And I don't think he's really all that inclined to grant our requests. See, prayer is about relationship, way more than requests. It it involves, you know, praise and worship and thanksgiving, and and it, it involves us saying, God, I need you and I want you, and yes, it involves requests. 
because that's a natural part of relationship. Um, and I'm just going to tell you this on the sovereignty thing. We pray because we serve a God who can change lives. If you believe extremely in, in free will, then God has limited himself or can't change people. I, I believe in a sovereign God who has the power to change lives, so I ask him to do it, and, and, and I don't stop. Finally, sharing our faith matters for two reasons. I mentioned last week uh, one of those, and that is simply this. Uh, it's obedience to Jesus. Jesus said you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. That's what I want you to do. He gave us this commission, this great commission, to go and make disciples of all nations. And so here's the thing. We're going to be obedient to Jesus, or uh, you're going to use your theology to disobey, and in that case, you have bad theology. If you, if you try to justify disobedience using the Bible, you've really strayed a, f a long way from truth. And so that's the first reason. The second reason we share our faith is because of the incredible joy it is to be included in the eternal work of God. When we share our faith, we're meeting the Holy Spirit at the point of, of life change. And birthing new life is amazing. And we celebrate when we get to be a part of it. I became a grandfather again this week. My uh, oldest had her, her baby. And uh, that's right. Emily Joy Smith is now uh, my granddaughter. And you guys just applauded, and I received that, and it was the easiest delivery I've ever had. <laughs> yeah, you see, there's a celebration at physical birth. Can I just tell you something? When we get to be a part of spiritual birth, it is so amazing. It has the same joy in it because you watch somebody go from spiritual death to life. You watch the, the lights come on and it makes sense. And that is exciting. That's why we want to share our faith. That's why it makes a difference. Last question. What's the difference between mercy and grace? Mercy and grace. Now, I just confess, I use them interchangeably because I think they pretty much mean the same thing. There's a technical difference if you get right down to it, mercy is when punishment or judgment is withheld when we deserve it by somebody in authority or power over us. Basically, uh, we deserve to go to jail and we get a suspended sentence. That's mercy. Grace is simply unearned favor. It's unmerited love. It's getting something we don't deserve, we didn't work for. It's a gift given to us. That's grace. And we receive mercy and grace through Jesus. Because he chose us, not through our effort or our will. And because I believe this, I believe if anyone seeks God at all, it's because the Holy Spirit is working in their life, drawing them to Jesus. And I believe that if you trust Jesus and want to be saved, you will be. There's a lot of concern from people about, well, yeah, but what about people who, who want in do they, and, and, and they're not chosen? No, if you want in, you are chosen. Okay, and I just tell you that. If you want in, if you trust Jesus, and you go, I want to be part of this, good news, okay? Because nobody wants that on their own. And, and somebody asked the question, great question, about Matthew 7, 21, where Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father. And, and on that day, many will say to me, Did, Lord, I, I prophesy in your name, and I cast out demons in your name, perform miracles in your name, and I will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And, and how do we understand that? Well, it's really simple. Read the whole context. You back up the verses before that, and Jesus is talking about false prophets. He's talking about the Pharisees. He's talking about people who are trying to get in on their own merits. They're not trusting in Jesus at all. They're, they're trying to earn it. They're trying to be good enough and do enough good things so they qualify for heaven. And if you're here and you're working your butt off trying to get to heaven, you're going to be sorely disappointed because it's not going to happen. It happens because we trust Jesus, because we can't earn it. We can't get there on our own. It is grace. It is mercy. And that is it. And if you're sitting here today and you're going, I've never made that decision. And I got this weird feeling like I should be like committing myself to Jesus. And, and, and I feel like God's talking to me. And I don't know what that really feels like. Then guess what? It's time for you to get real with God. Because he's drawing you to Jesus. And it's time for you to commit. God promises that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So don't be afraid. If, if you know that you're saved, 
to know that grace has saved you and grace will keep you. And ultimately, again, I'm just going to tell you what ultimately matters is that you know Jesus, that you've experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Whether you believe that you chose God or whether you believe God chose you, it really doesn't matter as long as you believe in the life-changing, soul-saving power of Jesus. Will you pray with me?